Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, the organizers and Marco Rovnik especially for, for uh, inviting me to this very unusual, very unusual, very emotional and very, very interesting uh, uh, conference. Uh, I think it's also the same thing for many of you. So uh, I do also believe that uh, it is important, rather than just us talking and talking about things we know, to also organize some discussion session, I think, for tomorrow, and to really st sit down and talk a little bit about the things we have learned. There are so many interesting things, and uh, some exciting and very, I would say, alarming things happening around us these days. Well, I'm sure that if I show you this picture, uh, everyone around the world will recognize what it is, where it is, and for what reason it is happening. Of course, uh, only uh, nice things would come out from seeing a picture like this, but now today there are certain negative things that come out, to in, come in mind, and that reminds us of the, the fact that it is not only that Europe is deriving its fame and its glory from financial uh, banks and uh, uh, economic institutions. Its glory and its uh, future rests, according to many, many people, to the basis of the civilization that ancient Greeks provided. I don't think we should forget that. And the other thing is that a thinking out of the box is what we all must do. And Greeks have already stepped out of the box. We have gone through a lot of boxes and we cannot take it anymore. So I would imagine it would be a good uh, idea to discuss with you how can all of Europe step out of the box of austerity and strict measures that really make life very, very unhappy. Happiness and smiling, what did we hear from other speakers? Pleasantly uh, singing and uh, whistling is really what we should do. Ask yourselves if you are happy, not if you are rich. Anyway, our uh, business here is to try to uh, understand complexity and uh, Stephen Bishop said it and a lot of people spoke about why the world is complex. What is it we understand about it? Is it models that we can invent that will help us? And is there any use for mathematicians? Are we any uh, useful today that uh, can help us in the world? Uh, we all understand what complexity is if I express it in these words, the things we have been able to define and understand to this day. It is really difficult to speak about large systems, but then you have to ask yourself, what are we looking for? We are looking for something that is out of non-equilibrium, something that can come out of chaos, and certain words like the ones I am going to propose to you today, certain fundamental uh, structures that we're going to study are going to shed some real light on complex problems. So we must decide, we should come up with certain new phenomena, new tools, new ideas and concepts to face the problems we have today. Well, let me say mathematics has already proved helpful a little bit. Until today, we have discovered certain things. Uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, the theory of chaos was not known to anyone. Today, there is not one single person with any intelligence, who hasn't seen the theory of chaos somewhere in his life. We have invented a new geometry. And all the complicated tree structures that we see, even in the bronchial lungs, in the arteries of the body, in the blood flow, uh, the trees and the rocks and everything around us has, this, has uh, introduced us to a new kind of geometry. But beyond these tools, what I believe is very important is that we now have to use our brain, our mind, our intuition, to build models. Models, you can say, may be fiction, may not represent reality at all. So we have to understand and build models that are useful. And the models that are useful must capture the essential elements about the phenomenon we are studying. And they must tell us something that we did not know before. Let me try to take you through a little trip uh, around such models that I believe have been very useful in mathematical physics today. My, uh, f the first question I would like to pose today is, is it mathematics of any relevance if we want to study natural life or social sciences? And I have a hint here. I don't think we should only look for universal principles, for the laws of Newton and Coulomb and, uh, have already been discovered to a large extent. 
maybe we should look for something else that is behind the behavior of social systems, of human beings, of human organization, than just some kind of universal principle or law. Is it perhaps that our intuition and our perception can help us build suitable mathematical models that will be reveal some secrets about the systems we are studying? This is what I want to pose to you today. Now, when we look at a simple thing like a tree around us, and we ask ourselves, how would an artist, we heard a lot about art today, how would an artist see it, and are we to gain very much from the point of view of an artist? Well, many people would say, yes, of course you can gain a lot from an artist. And we all know what we gain. The inner beauty, we heard from another speaker. Yes, indeed, Van Gogh and Mondrian and others showed us the inner beauty. Is there anything that the mathematician can say? Well, before that, uh, one might say, well, let's ask a bi uh, biologist. And he would say, ah, wait a minute, if you don't understand the plant cell, if you don't look at the nucleus and all the genetic uh, uh, procedures that are going on inside it, how are you going to ever understand it? Well, but I am a very modest person, and I would like to understand the first thing that I see about a tree. What I see about a tree is a self-similarity. I begin with a trunk, and then I have branches. And the branches have a systematic way of branching out of each other. First of all, they do so at a smaller scale. So self-similarity under scaling may be a new concept that I want to apply to this creature. However, it is not the only one. Because if I do not endow my system with the operation of rotation, I will not be able to see a tree in a two or three dimensions. I therefore have to say that in my poor mathematical mind, these two things are important to create at least this illusion of a tree. I understood something, but now let me go deeper. The person who went deeper into the story is a mathematician called Michael Barnsley in the 1980s. He discovered, and he wrote a beautiful book with theorems and proofs, that after all, if you are willing to start with contracting transformations, making things smaller at a certain scale, and bifurcating self-similarly from each other, and if you are willing to add a number of, uh, in, uh, besides contraction, a number of transformations, you would end up, in the end, with the same limit and the same form. Let's take, for example, this picture here. I can take an initial shape and break it down in three shapes. But if I decide to also rotate each one by uh, 90 degrees to the right, 90 degrees to the left, and I continue doing this repeatedly at smaller and smaller scale, who knows what I may discover? It may look like a Christmas tree. It may look something else more realistic? Maybe. Suppose I decide to displace them a little bit, and now I have two or three transformations. One speaks about displacement, the other about rotation, the other about contraction, and I end up with something that to me looks a little bit like an ivy. Uh, uh, plant growing at, on the walls of your house. Now, is there anything else I can understand from this? Yes, there is, a lot. I can now take any shape you like, parallelogram, add to it another two or three shapes next to it, and as you see here, it's not only one, two, and three, there is this little four. It's a very, very thin parallelogram, which is the stem. And I take this structure and I repeat it, over and over again in many iterations, many of you know what I will get. Not a photograph, not a picture of reality, but a mathematical plant of the fern. And what is the, here the idea? Is it so remarkable that we can plot it and we can picture it this way? Is that all there is to it? Is it perhaps that there is simple rules of two, three transformations? Is what is hidden in a seed? I cannot understand a seed giving birth to such a huge complexity if it is not a certain number of transformations that are fit inside the seed. The rest is go on and repeat, repeat, repeat the same thing many, many times. This I can understand. Maybe that's the way nature works. So now we know how to call these topics mathematically. Yes, we call them fractal and have fractal geometry, but at least maybe we discovered something new about the way the world works around us. Of course, you have heard of chaos and uh, fractals, and chaos are connected, and people will uh, be a little bit surprised to say, hey, the one thing is static. 
fractals is just geometry. The other thing is dynamic. Dynamics is motion. Uh, but that's not only the two sides of the same coin. Because as we discovered after Poincaré, in taking simple models and iterating populations of rabbits on a little island, we discovered that the evolution of a population of rabbits is, if you care to increase the rate that we may multiply, then from a very nice region of small rates of population growth, where you get periodic, regular behavior, out comes what but another tree. Another tree with fractal shape. And a tree that goes from bifurcation to bifurcation into something that we call weak chaos over here and strong chaos over there. So you will see very shortly what is the difference between weak chaos and strong chaos in a, in a few minutes. So we are not afraid of trees. We like trees. We like fractal geometry. And we ask ourselves, what is this concept of bifurcation? Can I apply it to cockroaches on a dish? And the first impression would be, well, only crazy scientists would play a game like this. But they did. And they created an experiment where the cockroaches are entering this dish. And as you know, cockroaches are afraid of light. So they go to hide themselves inside the two shelters. Now, if you begin by increasing the capacity of the shelters, then as long as you are at low capacity, the, the cockroaches will fill the shelters equally, 50%. They just divide in two. And then, all of a sudden, comes the knowledge that these two shelters are now very big in capacity. And the cockroaches, for some reason, decide to all go into one. Isn't this a bifurcation like the one you saw in the previous slide? So isn't there a work for mathematicians? I think yes. So this collective change of behavior, without any apparent communication with the cockroaches, I have to understand it. It's a new phenomenon. It's a phase transition. Now, I have, of course, the very, very uh, interesting references. What I'm talking about was a group of Brussels headed by Dennebourg uh, a few years ago in Nature. And then you say, oh, uh, can we become a little more ambitious? If we talk about cockroaches, why not birds and why not fish? Why not people? Can we say something about bigger organizations? Being always modest mathematics, mathematicians. Yes, I wouldn't be afraid to, uh, to try to find out order to come out of chaos and self-organization. How would I do that? Well, I did it with some of my colleagues, and they started actually in Brussels, also the group of Greeks working there, and now we are proceeding with this uh, story. We decided to add, to make a model of this phenomenon, by accepting first that the birds change their flight by plus or minus delta zero angle, a small angle. So they're not crazy to make a big change in the angle. They must also have a velocity, and they must also change that velocity. Now, this you can think about people also walking in a square. Do we form groups? Do we get together if we don't know each other? What happens if you put a lot of people who don't know each other on a square, walking around looking at books, sh uh, shelves, and so on? Well, let's find out. Let's include interactions in this. Because not all the birds will talk to each other, only if you are within me. I will not shout at you at the end of the, of the square. I'll only talk to you if you're close to me. Say, do you like the same book? What do we do here? And that's what the birds would say. And now, I will also choose some parameters ah, from my favorite model of the logistic map, which has chaos, as you saw here, weak chaos, strong chaos, and periodicity. Do these things in my model do anything? There is a periodic domain. There is a weakly chaotic domain, and there's a strongly chaotic domain. So now, do these make any difference in the way the birds fly? Well, yes, this is my parameter from 0 to 1. And let's see what happens now. Yes, the answer is it does make a difference. If you wanted to start your birds from the strongly chaotic regime, you would get a very disordered and meaningless type of group of uh, beings. If you care to go to the periodic regime, you would get a number of birds and points flying around in a periodic way, very nicely, uh, in a regular fashion. But if you wanted to go to the weekly chaotic regime, you would discover what I call very important effect of locking, clustering. Just uh, like we do, like birds do, we like to form groups 
Even if you don't know each other, you'll talk to somebody and you'll make a bird. Uh, now, you may ask me, okay, how do you uh, uh, believe it that we chaos is so important? Is flocking important? All right, well, let's place our birds all at A. In other words, I begin at the region of my parameter where you believe, you remember, there was a, a line here as a first bifurcation. This is the weak chaos regime. And what do you see? For 300 birds, at time 2,000, at time 6,000, 15,000, they begin to gather around the weak chaos point. I don't understand it. I cannot prove it mathematically, but it is true. They all go to that. So that means flocking is like an attractor. They like to flock. Dynamically, they go and make that choice. So if they do make that choice, and I want to study it, can I do it by playing a little bit of a story? We may hear some music. I don't know if any one of you recognize it. Uh, my friend Costadino Chalis from Brazil was there. That's a hint. So you try to figure out the music. And you see what the birds are doing. They started from a regular region. I am advancing the time a little bit. And we are going to the flocking regime. So far you see some very small indication of flocking. But as the time proceeds, and we are going towards the regime, you see what happens. For some reason, the beings and the points that we endowed with these two or three fundamental rules of interacting with each other in very simple ways, they ended up with very few groups at the end, uh, as if they like to do it by the dynamics. Okay. Pardon me? Can I, can I turn off the music? Yes, thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so, I, what I wanted to say is that, uh, yes, we can go ahead and be a little bit more daring. After all, this conference here has impressed me, how daring people are to make uh, also uh, very important statements about the future, about ourselves. So let me be a little more daring. After all, you will hear about this uh, phenomenon from a very interesting fellow who is visiting you tomorrow. Or when is Dirk Helbing speaking? Dirk Helbing is going to be here tomorrow, right? And yes, Dirk is, uh, I think uh, Stephen Bishop also mentioned him, the head of the Future ICT. So on, I think Dirk uh, Helbing is one of the world's experts in uh, studying problems of the uh, mo uh, mobility of people. If you put people walking into a row, uh, in a supermarket or, or maybe an airport like this, then local rules, you see the probability of you t going to the right to avoid this guy is bigger. If you live in the world where, uh, away from Britain and Australia and uh, other such strange countries, uh, we, all, we all like to go right, not left. So we go right, he goes right, or she goes right, and then we end up from a local phenomenon to a group phenomenon. There is a phase transition. People walking around, uh, coming from the two sides uh, randomly, will divide into two groups very, very shortly, and they will follow the leader and have all of these. Now, this we can apply also to cars. Dirk Helbing again comes into the story, who invented the so-called intelligent driver model. And he was able to show a very nice article with his colleagues that you see down here, sometime about 10, 12 years ago, that if you de describe the cars by the distances, by the velocity, by the reaction he gets when he sees this guy stopping, he will stop, he will stop, and they will produce backward going waves. There's a traffic jam up here. And this traffic jam, as you see in time, this is time, progresses backwards. And that's very natural. So that's the first thing you would like your model to do. Well, what did we do in Patras? We simply started working uh, many years ago with uh, Ko van der Welle, who is a Dutch fellow and a professor in Patras now with me. And we were uh, looking not at cars, but at granular matter going down a staircase, putting some flow in and some flow out. Now, if you do this carefully, and you also shake this upside down, then this, the grains will go down. This has also industrial applications. And you will find out that if you choose correctly some flux function of how you do it, if you are very uh, not crowded, there will be uh, very little uh, flux. The flux is increasing, and then the flux will decrease. Now, if you use a little bit of a mathematical formula for the flux, you will find out that in the beginning, you have a very nice equilibrium. Whatever comes in, comes out. 
Then you start to increase the flow in. And you notice a little wave is going to go back. And that's the telltale something bad is going to happen soon. What is the bad thing? The bad thing is that if you have inflow and outflow so far, now you will not. Because now, for this kind of critical value, as you see here, we have a, have a traffic jam. All the grains will collect on the first, and then your uh, industry or your experiment is going to not continue anymore. Now, if I can do this with uh, grains, why don't I do it with cars? So I divide the highway into pieces, and then I speak about how many cars I have in every box. In the beginning, the cars are all equal size, but uh, in another model, a more advanced model, you can also put trucks as a, a second size, major size, a smaller size cars, and you can study that flow this way. Again, mathematics can come into the story, and you notice here a flux function. Now, the flux function, though, can come to us, and this is from coming into the road and out the road from uh, the sides, uh, the flow in, the flow out, and now we will choose our flux function from reality. So we go to the Netherlands, where my colleague Van der Veel is from the Netherlands, and we take information from the road that there is indeed a flux function that looks a little bit like our mathematical formula that you saw before. So there is some truth to our models, and now we can start to see whether our models run. Well, do they run? Here are two lanes. The one on the outside is slower, and the one here is faster. The slow one has more cars, a little more cars coming in, and this one has fewer cars coming in. And now we're going to see what will happen if the two lanes do not interact. Uh, I think I should say, uh, Slovenians, yes, okay. PowerPoint, hopefully. Yes. So you see, there is no interaction, and there will be, look at the waves going backwards. The, wa the traffic jam goes backward, now the boxes of the highway get filled, and although some of the cars keep going, admittedly those are a little slower than the other ones over there, you will see that we reach an impasse. After a while, the, tree, the, the road has been jammed. Now we have an impossibility for the flow to continue. Yes, yeah, sure, if you wait long enough, you will see a few more cars going, but you have a problem. And now we will decide to open the two lanes so that cars from the slow lane can go to the fast lane. More probably, because there are more of them. And look what happens. Yes, there was a traffic jam, but the traffic jam went back all the way, and it finally it solved the problem in a way. It occupied much. There is a th still a traffic jam. We didn't completely avoid it, but it is still now a lot further back than where it was. And uh, if we continue, we will see those guys also disappear, maybe because of the interaction of the lanes. Uh, there are many uh, models that one can do and study, and we have done in Patras uh, our own share of the work. And that's just to tell you, finishing, uh, before the chairman becomes a little bit upset, uh, I will come to the end of the story by simply another biological model. Uh, it's nice to work with cars and birds and so on, but then we do want to answer questions that have to deal with the human health problem. Uh, from our point of view, what can we do? The models that we build are made of circuits, of oscillators. And here we have models, like we have in the heart, we do have uh, in, the, in the nerve uh, system. Before we go to the heart, this is just the way nerve cells would uh, uh, communicate with each other through the channels. There will be a potential difference, a potential difference because there are ions going through the valve and coming into the valve. Some valves may be closed and we will have current flowing so you get a message from your hand to your brain that you have touched something hot. Well, that can be done by mathematical equations, yes. And I can now uh, be, uh, tell you what will happen. The pulse, the nerve pulse you will feel. Later this, you can think of this as the heartbeat. As the heartbeat if we speak about the heart. This one will have a different shape uh, depending on whether you have ischemia, whether you have a arrhythmia, and, uh, a, a cardiac situation. So let me explain, to, uh, show you the difference. Hyperkalemia is the presence of uh, potassium, eh? K is potassium, over, over presence of potassium in the blood. The, if you increase the level of potassium, you see how much this changes? The, the normal and healthy shape is now changed and becomes very different. 
So now I can study the parameters of my equation that cause this shape, and I can relate it to the disease hyperkalemia. And here is the two-dimensional model of the heart. If we decided to do it in one dimension, we can do it in two. And here is what you see, the normal healthy behavior. This is a normal heartbeat f uh, going on the, sh on the surface of your heart, where the his purking tree is, and, and makes a contraction, and a beautiful, nice wave goes down every time your sinus, uh, the sinus um, uh, go, uh, impulse is coming to, to give you the, uh, the propagation of the pulse. If your heart and your uh, his purking your tree is perfectly nice and normal, then there will be no problem. But if there is a region which by we can be modeled as having the uh, ischemic effect of hyperkalemia, where the parameters are such that you match the ischemia uh, requirements, then this region here will make your normal beautiful heartbeat turn around. And the danger is it may develop a spiral wave, and spiral waves mean arrhythmia in the heart, and we will have a very dangerous situation at hand. So the question is, by models like this, by introducing these so-called necrotic regions, where the infarction of the heart is dangerous to happen, we can see the way it happens in our models and perhaps suggest the kind of drugs that will help alleviate the effects that you see in the model. That is the action potential that breaks at the necrotic region and may lead to spiral waves that lead to arrhythmia. Well, uh, what is complexity science after all? I believe that from what I showed you in this short talk, there is a unified methodology. We can at least look for it in order to study complex systems. We will become more familiar with mathematics, more familiar with models, and imagine and the new concepts, the new principles that must come together with our mathematical ability, our computers, our use of data in, in uh, the way future ICT will tell us, that's great, but we must have ideas to come up with ways to make models and imagine what the young people will do. As educators, and you and I know that, I know what is the enthusiasm of a young person when you give him a vision to do about life. This is what we are lacking in Europe now. We are looking, lacking the vision that made us what we are today. This amazing kind of enthusiasm with something, like building airplanes, for example, which can lead somebody to where Gregor Veble got. This is what our children need, and I think that complexity science and the interdisciplinarity of science will create, again, that love of science that will uh, help us find a better future. Yes, it is true that Hamlet will tell us, uh, wait a minute, Horatio, you know, don't be so rushing and so hurried. There are very, very many things that are not even dreamt by your beautiful philosophy. I agree with, ha with Hamlet, but I also find that complexity science has opened a window, a communication with nature, and we have become to glimpse a global picture of ourselves and the world that surrounds us. Thank you very much.